This is a tutorial on growth and decay exponential functions. The first thing that I'm going to talk about is exponential growth. And here we're given the formula for exponential growth. It's y is equal to p times 1 plus r raised to the t power. Now this is where y is our final amount. p is the amount that we start with. r is our rate of growth, which is usually a percentage. And when we plug that percentage into this formula, we always express r as a decimal. And then lastly, t is time. Now you may notice that this formula looks kind of similar to the standard form of an exponential function. It looks kind of like y is equal to a times b to the x. Well, it is kind of like that. In this case, p is our a and 1 plus r would be our b. And then lastly, x is our t. So that makes t our variable. Time is what's changing. Now, if p is our a and p is our initial amount, well, we don't usually start with a negative amount of something. So that means that with exponential growth problems, our a is greater than zero. Now if our b is 1 plus r, and r is some decimal or some constant rate of growth expressed as a decimal, that means we're going to have 1 plus some decimal, which means b is going to be greater than 1. Well, if we know that a is greater than zero and b is greater than 1, we can get a rough idea what our exponential growth graph is going to look like. We can expect our graph to look something like this. Now, our x-axis is actually our t-axis, and then our y-axis is the amount that we're looking for, so that means as time goes by, with an exponential growth problem, the amount of what we're looking for, or our final amount, is going to increase. So now let's see how we can use exponential growth. Here we're told that the amount of TV viewers for the WNBA basketball games has increased by an average of 7% each year. If the WNBA had 270,000 viewers in 2010, how many can they expect to have in 2015? Well, again, this is a growth because we're increasing, and we're increasing by a percent each year. So we're going to use our exponential growth formula, which again looks like y is equal to p times 1 plus r to the t. Now, p is our initial amount. And we don't really have any initial amount in fact, the only amount we have is 270,000 viewers. So if we call P 270,000, now we need to find our R. Well, R is usually a percentage and it's our rate of growth, so 7% each year. So our R is 7%. But remember, when we plug that into our formula, we need to use a decimal form of this. So we're going to plug in 0 0.07. So we have most of our formula here. We're up to y is equal to 270,000 times 1 plus 0 0.07 raised to the t. Now we want to find how many viewers they can expect in 2015. Well, in 2010, they had 270,000. So let's call 2010 time equal to zero. If we do that, that means our t in 2015 is going to be equal to five. So if I plug that in for t, I'll get y is equal to 270,000 times one plus 0 0.07 raised to the fifth power. Now, 1 plus 0 0.07 is 
And if we raise that to the fifth power, that's approximately 1.40. So if we take 270,000, we multiply it by 1.40, we're going to get 378,000 viewers. So the WNBA can expect to have 378,000 viewers in 2015. Now next we're going to talk about a special form of exponential growth. And this is called compound interest. Compound interest is the type of interest you usually get from your savings account or that you find on your credit card. Here we're given the formula for compound interest. It's A is equal to P times 1 plus R over N all raised to the n times t. Now this is where a is our future balance, p is our initial balance or what we initially invest, r is our interest rate and again we always express that as a decimal and then n is the number of times the interest is compounded per year or per t. So let's see how we can use this formula. Here we're told that Joe gets a $100 check for his birthday. His mom tells him to open a savings account and deposit the money. His local bank offers a savings account with 3% interest rate that is compounded monthly. So what will Joe's account balance be after two years if he doesn't make any more deposits? And how about after 10 years? Well, to figure this out, we're going to use our compound interest formula. That's A is equal to P times 1 plus R over N to the N times T power. Now our P is the initial amount that we're going to invest. So this $100. Our R is our interest rate expressed as a decimal. So that's 0 0.03. Our N is the amount of times that we're going to compound this interest. Well, if we're going to compound it monthly, that means there's 12 months in a year, so we're going to compound it 12 times. So we're going to end up with our formula here. A is going to be equal to 100 times 1 plus 0 0.03 over 12 raised to the 12 times T power. So now we just need time, or a value of time, that we can plug in and find out our account balance, or A. Well, first we're asked after two years. So let's plug in two for T. If we do that, we'll get A is equal to 100 times 1 plus 0 0.03 over 12 all raised to the 12 times 2 power. Now 1 plus 0 0.03 over 12 is equal to 1.0025. And if I take that and I raise it to the 24th power, or 12 times 2, I get approximately 1.06 one eight. So if I take 100 and I multiply it by 1.0618, I get 106.18. So after two years, Joe's going to have $106.18. Now how about after 10 years? Well, after 10 years, the only thing that's going to change is our T. Our T is going to be 10 this time. So if I plug that all in, I have A is equal to 100 times. Now, this is still times 1 plus 0 0.03 over 12. And it's raised to the 12 times 10 power. Now I'm going to rewrite this 1 plus 0 0.03 over 12 as 1.0025 
and that's going to be raised to the 12 times 10 or the 120th power. This is equal to 1.3494. So if I take 100 and I multiply it by 1.3494, I'm going to find out that my final balance is $134.94.